Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Fridays with Fiscal. Um, today, we're going to be going over all the updates for USPS and USAS um, from December to current, which is the end of March, beginning of April. So let's go ahead and get started here. Um, let's see, on six, the, the 628 release, which was back in December, uh, uh, December 4th, there were some bug fixes that were made. Uh, the SOAP service was not correctly returning employee email uh, direct deposit flags, so they made a correction to that. Um, they also updated the ODGFS report to use legal name properties. Uh, so if the legal name uh, fields were populated on the employee record, it's going to be using those for the ODGFS report. Uh, they also updated the ODGFS new hire report to use the employer employee employee excuse me employee hire date if there's no ODGFS hire date populated. So basically, on this screen here, the employee record, if there is no ODGFS hire date, which is down here, that is blank, it's going to be using the hire date that's populated on the employee record. And the other thing that the bug fix that they uh, corrected was uh, allowing expenditure accounts that have no description listed to be included in that USS, uh, in expend USS expenditure account grid. So under the USS integration tab, um, it will actually allow those expenditure accounts to be displayed, even if they don't have a description listed. Let me go ahead and let up. So here, there's the expenditure accounts under the use as integration tab. It will now allow those with no description to be shown. So if, there, if it's the blank description, it'll still be there, but just no description listed. Um, improvements that were made on that 628 release um, were updating the overtime rounding to match what we currently do in Classic. There was an issue with uh, rounding for overtime that was corrected. Uh, we removed any unused properties from the payee record um, for reports. Uh, basically, that pretty much helps the processing time um, of reports and of reports and such. So, if you go to like the custom report creator and you go to the payee object you'll see that the, the property like pay item that, that used to be there, that was removed. And again, that helps a lot as far as like the processing time of this. So that's why they took care of getting rid of that, making it uh, easier, making it quicker to process. A new features that were added on the 628 release um, were to allow the position record to be archived in the past, there was no option to archive position records, but now on the position record itself, we have that archive flag. So you can actually go in and archive those records so they don't, they're not displayed unless you include the archived option and they will be displayed. So right here is the archived option. So if you check that, that record will now be archived if you saved it. Um, we added the primary compensation. Lori, I have a question. Yeah, sure. So if you archive a position, it doesn't automatically archive the associated compensation record. Is that on purpose or is that going to be a feature in the future? Um, not really sure about that. My guess is you're correct on that. If you archive just a position record, the compensation will still be out there. Um, that is something, let me write that down and I will ask. I don't know if we've had that question posed to us, but I'll write it down so we can ask. Yeah, because it seems like if you archive the position, it would be nice if it would automatically archive the compensation record. I do not believe that it will do that. Um, let's just take a look here. We can test it real quick. And I'm pretty sure it doesn't. Uh, let me just find somebody's compensation. Somebody that has one. <laughs> Be a little simpler. Um, let's 
let's do this one. Tyrone Carpenter. All right. So I'll go to the position and archive Tyrone Carpenter, but I'm pretty sure the compensation will remain. We'll double check to make sure. All right. Save that. Then I'll go back to the compensation record. Yeah, it's still there. So that's something I will go ahead and, and maybe even bring that up at our next sprint meeting and talk about it because um, right now you have to go in, archive the position, archive the compensation, both. It would be really nice if you could just archive the position and would automatically archive the compensation. So I yeah. will definitely, uh, the, yeah, I will definitely bring that up because that would be that would be a really good feature. I, I yeah, think. that would be really nice, especially for the people that are reportable to EMIS. Yep. Thank you. Yep, no problem. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, we added the primary compensation flag to the uh, compensation record. So basically, if they wanted to list like one particular position as the primary compensation. That gives them the capability of doing that. I know the reason we did it, there was a large district that I think they were wanting to run reports or something and they wanted just those primary compensations to be pulled in. So that's why we added that, but um, that's a really nice option. That way they you can have that uh, compensation mark as the primary record. Uh, we added the save and recall parameters to the employee earnings register and also to the payment transaction status report. And as you can see with releases that have been coming out, we've been adding more and more save and recall parameters to many different reports. Most of the reports are uh, reports that are uh, the canned reports that we have out there, but we're adding, you know, that feature continually. We're trying to get it added to most of all of the canned reports that are there right now. Um, on the 6281, we had a hot fix that we had to send out, and that was basically to update the uh, tax tables, the federal and state tax, tax tables for calendar year 2021. And then, sorry, for count, yeah, 2021, sorry. And then we also updated the FICA constant for the calendar year 2021 as well on that hot fix. And then we also made an improvement to the performance of the W-2 report and the submission option. So we made some improvements to that. That was back on December 14th. Um, on December 15th, we had another hot fix we sent out, which was the 628-2 release. And that corrected a bug in W-2 reporting. And that was kind of a hit or miss bug, I want to call it, because there were two items that had to be true in order for uh, the district or the employee to be affected by the bug. And those were, they the employee had to have multiple Medicare records. Um, basically, someone likely would maybe pick up on one job and not pick up on the other. And then they also had to have federal adjustments that they made like um, life insurance, taxable benefits, adoption assistance, something like that. The, the, those combinations caused the problem. So we corrected that with, uh, bug with that hot fix. Then we had the 629 release, which was set out on December 18th. Uh, there were bug fixes that were corrected. The first one was uh, correcting an error that was found um, in rounding employee fixed amounts for second pay for payroll items. And this was a real big one. We had a lot of people that had questions this because in classic, if an employee has a, a deduction that was withheld like first pay, second pay, and maybe the first pay it withheld 33, 33, and then the second pay it always held with held 33, 34 to total up the dollar amount of the deduction. Well, in redesign, it, the rounding was causing a problem. So districts were saying, hey, we're off, you know. So each person might have been off a cent or two. Well, obviously one person a cent or two, but then when you have 
500 employees, that adds up to a lot. So what was decided was basically to round the calculation the same way Classic does it. Um, so to uh, preserve the, the parallel consistency and basically ensure that both amounts for the month always added up to the fixed rate amount. So we made sure of that. So it's going to be, it's pretty much working like Classic did now. And then also another bug fix, we, we found that a retirement refund had a city tax withheld that was pretty much already withheld when they the payroll was processed, but then they did a, a refund and it was withholding it again. So we corrected that withholding, uh, corrected that. So it's not withholding that annuity when a refund is being processed. Another bug fix was uh, fixing the member deposit calculation for the SCRS employer who have multiple position level pickup earnings. So uh, what was happening, the pickup amounts were not being added to the other pickup amounts for an employee that had more than one pickup amount, pickup position. And so it was overriding the value. And because of that, the last position that was paid was basically the winner, so to speak, the amount withheld um, was incorrect. So they made the, the fix and corrected that. So now anybody that has pickup for um, SERS with more than one job or even SERS pickup and then another job not pickup, it made the correction and fixed that. Um, another thing that they did was they added the employer amount to the H HSA ACH file. Um, before, if there was an employee amount that was zero or less, so basically that's not getting included on the ACH file. If they had employee amounts withheld, those were not getting included on the ACH file. So now if you have an employee that has a negative amount or is zero and it's not included on the H, uh, ACH file, the HSA, HSA ACH file, if employer amounts were withheld, those will get included on the ACH file. Um, improvements that were made on the 629 release, uh, the W-2, the ITIN number was updated to use all zeros for W-2 submission files. And that's based, based on IRS spec, uh, specifications because the ITIN cannot be on the W-2 report or the submission file because it starts with a nine. And this SSA W-2 says it is invalid in the SSA field and it moves zero to the SSN. Uh, on the W-2 report in the submission file, we should put nine zeros for the social security number and we put a warning uh, that the, uh, on the W-2 report that it is for ITIN, it must be zero on the submission file. Um, and, and another thing to keep in mind, one district could have multiple employees that have ITINs. So basically we fix this to match the specifications for the IRS. Um, another thing that we, another improvement that we made was we added the new COVID fields to the redesigned importer. So basically if you were using, if the district was using classic and they had the COVID fields uh, populated in there, we actually added that information to the importer. So when you do an import that was uh, being included. New features on the 629 release. Um, we added, again, the save and recall features to multiple reports. We added to the SCRS report, SCRS uh, per pay report, the census report, the benefit obligation by account, benefit obligation by employee, and the afford report. So all, all of those now have that save and recall option as well. On the, we sent out a hot fix on December 22nd. It was a 629-1 release. Um, it changed all the W-2 submission file uh, files to end with a .txt extension instead of a .seq extension. Uh, the reason we did this is several tax entities that were asking for a .txt extension file. And so we did that pretty much for the benefit of the districts and the ITCs as well, because that will prevent the user, the district user, 
or the ITC from having to change the extension before they upload the files. We also had a hot pick sent out on December 27th. That was a 629-2 release. And what that was for was to update the RS and RE records on the CCA file. Um, for the RE record on the submission file, we're, we moved uh, the, we, we were, bleh, excuse me, we, uh, we moved an R or a Q to the establishment number in position 27 on the CCA file. Um, the establishment number was in, is in position 27 to 30. And then position 28 through 30 will be spaces. The value moved to the establishment number should be the same as the employment type found in position 219. So we made sure that we corrected that on the uh, CCA file. And then for the CCA file on the RS uh, record, the following changes we made. Um, reporting period is now in position 197 to 202. Uh, total, un total unemployment in position 203 to 213. The taxable unemployment in positions 214 to 224. The work weeks in position 225 and 226, or 222 to 226, sorry. Uh, employed date in positions 227 through 234. Separation day positions 235 through 242. Positions 243 to 247 are uh, space, are just uh, space filled. State ID number and on WG screen will be in position 248 through 267. Uh, state code is in, are, is in positions 274 to 275, and that will be uh, 39. And then the state total wages is in position 298 to, two to 307. And then the state name is in position 413 to 414. On December 30th, we had the 630 release go out. Uh, oh. We had bug fix which corrected a bug that was incorrectly adding employer pickup values to history. So the values were never being used uh, if the employee was not a pickup employee, but it was very confusing to see the value in the payment grid. So we corrected that so it was not no longer showing there. There were improvements made on the 630 release. Uh, we improve, improved the afford report to use the determined date range for the employee in the days and month calculation. So example, um, the afford report was not handling a situation where the employee's first pay day was after the, the user entered date for the afford report. So like an example would be the afford report you had start date of 11-1-2020 through 11-15 of 2020. The employee started on 11-3 of 2020. Uh, the report should use a start date for the employee to do the calculation for the month and days. And it wasn't doing that. But now, as it's corrected, it should be doing that uh, every time you process the report. Um, another improvement was to allow non-taxable reimbursement pay type, which is out in future. Uh, let me just go on and show you that real quick. In the before was not allowing that to be added without a retirement flag being checked. So we corrected that. So now you do not have to have the retirement flag checked in order to save it. So here's what I'm talking about. I'll just go into this record that we have out there. Maybe. And then this non-taxable reimbursement. If I change that and then if I uncheck the apply for retirement, it saved it before it was not saving it. So that was a problem. On December 30th, we had a hot fix go out, the 630.1 hot fix. Uh, what it was, we found out that a user, if a user entered a dash character in the W2 configuration submitter EIN field, and the district was uh, set up to submit the files on by themselves. 
the dash was being included in the RA record and that caused the file to be rejected. So what we did is for all state, federal, state and other EIN values, we are basically just stripping any existing dashes prior to writing the submission file. So now basically they can create their file if they accidentally put a dash in there, it's not gonna matter because we're stripping it out. Um, on January 5th, we, I, we had a hot fix, the 630.2 go out. And that was basically to add a new XML tag from the building and department code to the W2 XML file. Those tokens build in department building. On January 11th, we had a 633, 630.3 release go out. That was a hot fix as well. We corrected the year ODGFS file saved to the file archive. There were some problems with the ODGFS report going to the correct year. So we, we fixed that. Um, we also corrected an internal error uh, when districts were processing the Indiana W2 submission file. There was an issue, there was a problem with the Indiana city tax records that it, it was just a random occurrence. It didn't happen for everyone, but just randomly it was happening. So they corrected that. We also fixed the calculation for the quarter to date employer Medicare contribution um, for, for the 941 on the quarter report. The quarter report wasn't totaling the quarter to date employers Medicare contributions correctly. Uh, the quarter report employer Medicare contribution seemed to be using the same total as the quarter to date employees Medicare contributions on the quarter report. Uh, but really the total of employer share of Medicare for the quarter usually matches the employer share. So they made a correction to that. So the 941 amount Medicare amount will be accurate. On the 631 release, which was set on January 13th, there were some bug fixes that were uh, corrected. Um, one was for outstanding payables. Um, an error uh, during the posting would prevent previous items posted from being reported in the archive. So if an, if an error occurred when posting outstanding payables, the items roll back as you expect, but if the user was processing multiple pay item codes at one time, uh, the ones that did post did not did not produce a report. Uh, so they fixed that uh, so that would it would basically post everything out there. Um, they updated the outstanding payables posting method to catch, try to catch all exceptions. If one item fails, it would track it and continue processing. So that's how they basically fixed it. Um, another bug fix was the W-2 control number was skipping if an employee had multiple pay items for the same configuration. So on the W-2 report form and XML, if an employee has multiple city tax items for the same uh, configuration, maybe uh, they have multiple city record, but different position levels, then those are combined on the report and form and XML. However, when determining the number of pages needed to print the items, they were counted separately. So the page count is used to determine the control number and that was causing numbers to be skipped on the reports, forms and XML update page. So uh, they fixed the control numbers to, to adjust for, you know, if there were multiple city records, say for the same city, uh, instead of skipping uh, control numbers, it corrected that. And then the third thing that we fixed was the W-2 city tax items were being excluded from the XML uh, output file for employees. And again, this was a rare occurrence. It didn't happen for everybody, but a fix was made to correct it because um, some ITCs reported that a district had experienced that. 
So now uh, those are being included on the submission file and the PDF report um, and the XML file. That seemed to be where they were missing was from the XML file. Um, improvements that were made on the 631 release. Um, we allow user with the USPS admin password role permission to change passwords. Um, we made this update to be consistent with USAS. Uh, the user is still going to need the USPS admin user view permission to view the USPS users, but we allow that admin password role to now change be able to change passwords for an employee, for a user. Um, another improvement was updating the attendance post to payroll to allow modifications of pay amounts. Um, so if they were posting to future or current, um, before they couldn't adjust like the pay amounts or the rate, et cetera, in future, but now they have the capability of doing that. And then a new feature that was added was pretty much behind the scenes. It was just a uh, mass loading employees header information that was uh, corrected. On the 632 release, which was uh, sent out on January 29th, some improvements were, were made to the grid performance. Uh, we had a 10 to 83% improvement on the payroll item and the adjustment of grid. Those were the largest improvements. And th those needs we have improvements made because it was they were quite slow on the grids. And so the improvements helped a lot. Um, the other item that we made improvements to was the payroll update modify. We reduced the query of the batch service size. So the performance and the the speed of when you're doing a payroll update or making a modification and updating, that uh, goes a lot faster than it did previously. Some new features that we added on the 632 release um, were, were a mass load option, which allowed for mass loading of payroll items, payroll item configuration, positions, and user ad adjustment payables. On the 633 release, which was sent out on February 12th, we had a couple bug fixes. Um, we updated the earnings register to include taxable employer pickup for Medicare and Social Security tax. So that was a big one. Um, in the past, it wasn't including it. So when you were trying to do balancing and comparing, uh, the earnings register was not the same. So we made the court made that uh, adjustment. So now the Medicare and Social Security employer pickup amounts are included. Uh, we fixed the null pointer exception and compensation mass loader. Uh, what what it was for was when loading job calendars on the CSV. The uh, the logic was used to determine if it should load a job calendar reference or field, and that was not correct. So behind the scenes, uh, we made that correction. And so now if they're including the job calendar information on the CSV, that will load correctly before you were getting a null pointer error on that. We also correct, corrected a bug in the importer from classic of the dead tax record. Um, that sometimes is what's causing the import to fail. So we corrected that on the importer. And then we also had a report of an employee, um, their session was not timing out. And what didn't, it appeared it wasn't working properly when downloading items from the file archive. So the, the fix was made to correct the, that um, as far as timing out the user because um, it, the user was, you know, go, trying to get files, download files from the file archive. And then it just never timed her out. So pretty much she was just never timed out. Her session was always running. So they corrected that. Um, improvements made on the 633 release. Um, on the CCCJ extract, um, they will only uh, pull in records that have the EMIS reportable flag set to true. 
but so now if it's set default, it will not pull those records into the extract. New features on the release were um, if a previous compensation was marked as primary compensation, um, we're going to set the primary compensation flag on new contracts when activating. So when you're uh, creating a new contract for an employee, when you activate that, you will get a prompt. Let me go out here and show you what it looks like. You'll get a prompt asking you about that primary compensation. Uh, right here. Running a little slow this morning. There we go. So if I were to activate this record, I'm going to get a prompt. Are you sure you want to activate the contracts? And then do we want to lock in the pay period? Here's what I'm talking about. Transfer primary compensation, compensation flag to new compensation. If that is marked, then on the compensation record, that primary compensation flag will be checked, it will be marked. Um, we also, uh, for a new feature, create a mass loader to be able to mass load leaves. So that was a big one. A lot of people had asked for that. Now they can do that. On the 634 release, which was sent out on February 26th, we had a bug fix with, that corrected the classic importer mismatch for Medicare and FICA. So we had to basically teach the importer how to deal with mismatched uh, Medicare FICA records that came from classic. And then improvements that were made on the 634 release is uh, we added a, a position description to pay amount listing for custom form printing payments. Uh, the field name needs to be PA.position description. Um, and if you're using that, if you want that to be included on your uh, direct deposit notices, you have to remember to update the payment printing configuration direct deposit form with that new token added in there in order for that to be included on the uh, direct deposit stub. And then a new feature that we added was uh, a mass change option to clear the COVID fields out there on the uh, payroll item. So let me just go to payroll item quick. And we added that in two different places. We have it under payroll item itself, but then it's also listed under the federal item as well. So you can clear those fields in either place. So we've got the mass change option here under payroll item. And if you click on that, you'll notice on the, the load description, we have the clear federal tax COVID field option. But then also if I go to the federal tax item, that option is out there as well. That definition can be found the same. It's the same definition, but it's just under the federal tax item. So either place they could go in and use that clear, uh, clear COVID to get those zeroed out. On the uh, March 5th, we had a bug fix go out, which was on the 634-1 release. Um, we fixed the bug and pay account mass load and leaves mass load. What was happening was overriding optional properties with default values if they weren't included in the CSV file. So we had to correct that so that what wouldn't be happening. On the 635 release, which was set out on March 12th, there were some bug fixes. Um, there was one behind the scenes, which was made for the employee number generator service. That was just something they fixed in, like I said, behind the scenes. Um, another, Bug fix was uh, prevent archive compensations from being considered when importing attendance and posting to, cur to current or future. So if you have an archive compensation, it won't be considered now. 
if you're importing attendance or pay information to future cur or current. And then the other bug fix was to limit the characters stored in the audible events detail to prevent errors when uh, posting outstanding payables. So the problem was posting a payable that only has employer amounts and a large number of payables included. Um, that was causing issues. So they pretty much limited the characters that are stored now in the audible events. So that makes it a lot easier, Ma makes it a lot better, I should say. Um, improvements that were made on that 635 release was uh, include payables with employer amounts only in outstanding payables archive reports. It's because in the past, if um, the district was processing outstanding payables, and if a payable with employer amounts only was posted, the file archive report for payable summary and payable de detail did not include the, impa the payable because it was only employer uh, paid amounts. Um, if the employer payable is processed with another payable that has the same payee and has an employee amount, then the amount for the employer payable was showing. But what we're wanting is if you have just an employer amount being withheld on a particular payroll item, you want the district for wanting that to be going out to the file archive as well as um, reports that maybe had the same same payee or they had employee amounts paid as well as employer amounts. They wanted just employer amounts to be posted out there as well. So we fixed that. So now that will be occurring. Uh, we also changed the SARA surcharge amount from $19,600 to $23,000. And that was a, a correction that SERS wanted. I think it was because of the COVID issue. They wanted that corrected. They wanted to up the amount a little bit. And then they also moved the COVID mass change process to the federal tax grid, which we just looked at a little bit ago. Before, that was not available out there under the uh, federal payroll item. It was only available under payroll item. So we, moved, we have that out there in both places now. On the 636 release, which was set out on March 26th, we had a bug fix, um, which uh, to prevent voided and reconciled payments transactions from being reissued. Um, so no reconcile or voided payment transaction can be reissued for anything that's under check register, manual payment checks, payee payment checks, payee electronic transfers, direct deposits, payroll payment checks, refund checks, or refund ACH check, refund ACH records. So we need to prevent voided or reconcile payment transactions from being allowed to be reissued. So that was a bug fix that we corrected. Um, improvements that we made on this release is we added the higher date to the ODJFS employee section for the ODJFS report. So uh, what we're referring to is for the ODJFS new hire report. When you go out there now, you will see in the twin columns, the higher date will be listed next to the employee's name. So here we have the, my employee, but here is their hire date. We added that, in, that information. Um, we added an informational message to the payroll items for items with, for items for specific positions. And this is huge because we have a lot of, not problems, but a lot of times people were using the position record when they really didn't, or position number when they didn't need to. So now if they go out to create a payroll item, so let's just say I'm gonna create a city record. Because those are all positions. When I, anytime you pull up a record that will allow positions like your city, your SDRS, STRS, Medicare, when you pull up any of those records, 
this message will pop up. Position selection is only required if setting up payroll items withholding by position. But so if you don't want to add a position, you don't have to, which is a really nice feature that we have that out there now. Because like I said, a lot of people, especially for retirement, for going in, creating the 400 record, and then selecting the position one. And the same, you know, so it makes it much more convenient with this message now. They maybe will see that and not use that position option. And the last improvement that we made was uh, we made changes. Lori. Yes, yes. Yes. Um, this is Andrew with WOCO. Is, has there been any talk of being able to remove the position from the play, payroll item like you could in Classic? Um, you know, you could you could take it on and take it off in Classic, which is something I, I did use. I don't, I'm, I'm sure that it's not very common, but yeah. when I was at an ESC, I did, you know, you have a psychologist that works at this place and then they work at that place and they work at this place. So I would switch around mm -hmm. the city tax item, the position, you know, I would move that stuff. So I know that's not very common, but it is possible. I know, I know we've had that pose, that question posed, Andrew, and I, and I'm thinking, I think we have a dear issue out there for asking about that. So I, I'm not sure, obviously, when it will be addressed, but okay, I'll go look for it. Yeah, I know it's been posed. I'm pretty sure that question has been posed before, as far as being able to remove, you know, the position number that's been added because. I mean, okay. the, the problem that we've been experiencing with districts, you know, pretty much not ac they're accidentally adding it and it, it was causing issues. Um, it would be nice just to be able to go in and remove it. Yes. You know, having it set out there. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Write myself a note here. We really appreciate this message, though. Thank you so much for doing that. Yep. No problem. Okay, I'm writing myself a note here so I don't forget. All right, um, okay, so the last thing, that, the improvement that we made was um, to the benefit of accruals, uh, we pretty much, uh, the sorting options by name, and we added uh, the specific date to the parameter page. So now that information will show. And, we also added the option, which we had several requests, because before when you were running the benefit accrual, you could only run it for one individual type, whether it be sick or vacation. You had to run them separately. Now you have the capability of going in and choosing sick and vacation at the same time. So let me just show you that real quick. Under the benefit accrual option, we added the sick and vacation option here. Um, some new features that were added. We added a new compensation code. Um, that pretty much is a unique constraint that we added to compensation and it will appear on the position under the compensation record. What it does is it allows for easier mass loading of compensations, making it no longer required to have that ID on there, which was a real pain because the ID was like huge. It was really long. Um, so one thing <coughs> to keep in mind for this code is it can only be alphanumeric and um, it can have like a dash. Those will be considered. Um, a new field. Let's see, we already know that. Uh, a, a patch was written to basically default the compensation code value for anybody that currently had an ID already listed for the compensation. So we had a patch that fixed everybody that's currently listed out there. Um, when you create a new contract for an employee, once you activate the record, a unique code is going to be created on that compensation record. Now, if you are creating a contract or non contract manually, then you have to manually enter a code. And again, that code can be 
a, a combination of letters and numbers, and it can have hyphens in it as well. And the code has to be unique for each position given. So example, like position one cannot have two compensation with the code set as fiscal year 21. But a position one can have a compensation with co a code set to fiscal 21. And position two can have a compensation code with, uh, with a set to fiscal year 21. It's just that like two um, compensation, what, you know, Composition ones cannot have the same code set. It has to be unique. And one thing to keep in mind that code field is required. So whether they're adding a new uh, compensation record or manually adding it, if they leave that code field blank, they're going to get an error telling them that that is a required field. So they have to populate that field. Um, and the other thing that we did in this release is we added a new use as option to post voided and unvoided payments. So it's similar to the void and unvoid posting and batch files in Classic. Um, what you would do, you'd be able to go out, like if you voided a check or unvoided a check or a payment, you actually go out into use as integration to this payment void unvoid submission. And you will see that out there, that sitting out there, and it has to be posted to USAS in order for the process to go through. And then on the USAS side, they would take care of um, posting. And I'm sure Pat will be either talking about it today or we will be talking about it in the future here. But this is where all of that information is going to be posted when you do those voids or unvoids. And it actually tells you what type, whether it's on void or void, and then it gives you the option to post to use as. And then when I click the post to use as option, it'll show me an overview of the record that I'm posting. And if I want to submit it, I just click the submit to use as option. And then when I go back to the listing, you can see that the use has posting status shows sent. So I basically sent that to use as. All right. Um, on April 2nd, we had a hotfix go out, which was a 631.1 hotfix. Uh, what it was sent out for was to fix a bug that we uh, encountered on the ODGFS report. And what was happening, uh, it could create a database connection and it would never close it. So it was pretty much just sitting out there to cause a leak. So um, a district basically reported they experienced a problem with, they had like 14 active database connections and nothing was happening in the application. So it was pretty much determined by our, our developer that the ODJFS report creates two database connections when, it, when it's ran. And about 40% of the time, at least one of those connections would remain open indefinitely. So that situation with that district that had 14 active databases that connections was causing the district to actually it was not allowing them to post a payroll. So we fixed it. So the ODGFS report was not causing that problem. And then I'm gonna give you today's release, which isn't out yet that I know of. I haven't seen Mark's message, but what's gonna be coming out today on the 637 release, um, we have a new feature which will allow uh, mass loading for future pay data. Um, when you're uploading this data, it's not going to do anything as far as attendance. It's just pretty much loading to future. So if you're wanting to use, you know, a lo load attendance and future data, future data, you're going to still use that attendance absence import option. But this will actually allow you to mass load future data. Um, 
through a CSV file. And then another uh, feature that we're adding, we have uh, new, per new permissions that have been created for compensations. So all rules that had a position permission will now be updated to include new compensation permissions, which at the startup, those permissions are added. So if they had uh, access to positions, but they didn't to compensations, they're going to now because we added some new uh, rules for compensations. We added a USPS standard compensation, USPS standard compensation create, USPS standard compensation view, USPS standard compensation update, USPS standard compensation delete, and a USPS standard compensation report role. So if, if they're granted the USPS standard role, they're gonna, going to be given access to all of those uh, compensation options. Um, another new feature is we added another save and recall functionality, which is now for the quarter report. And another feature that we added is we created a legacy data file archive. So um, the, it's pretty much a new general archive option that users can load files into that they have that they basically want to keep. Um, they can load those out there into this um, legacy data file archive. And to, to find that, you'll be in the file archive option. <clears throat> And there's going to be a tab called Other. And right here is this legacy reports. So they can load data right directly into this legacy reports option. And then the last thing that we did on this release that is coming out today is we added a new funding source, which is funding source F, which is for federal special education part B IDEA grant school age to the CRDC reporting option that was currently not it wasn't available it now will be available as an option. And that is all I have does anyone have any questions on what we've gone over. And Andrew did find that your issue it was USPS RFB 850. Uh, the one that he was asking about removing position numbers on payroll items. Thanks, Andrew, for finding that. I appreciate it. Um, we'll go ahead and take about a five minute break, get uh, set up for the USAS side. Um, and if there's any other questions, you can definitely let me know, email me, throw it in the chat, whatever you want to do. But we'll take five minutes and let's say we'll be back here at about a little after 10, about 10, a little after. All right. Thank you.